So thank you for the introduction. So um, as Axel already introduced, my name is Michael, and I'll be talking about this large project that we're doing together with uh, JGI here. Actually, the project has also been partially done at JGI because um, I and my uh, colleague Tommy, who's also here, have been visiting scientists with JGI. So we've had a lot of fun here. So as you can see, this will be about uh, fungi, but since we're using these approaches that I've named here whole genus association analysis, which is basically a ripoff from the GWAS that's used for all sorts of other things, but at the uh, genus level, uh, there is no reason for why you shouldn't be able to use these approaches if you're working with plants or bacteria for that matter. So even if you're not a fungal person, you, you should find something of interest here. Um, with that said, of course, fungi are awesome and superior. And, um, and there are many good reasons for this, but, but as you can see from the picture that I have of a fungus over here, many of you may know already that fungi secrete hundreds, so typically three to 500 different enzymes that can be used for degrading biomass. But the brownish spots you see on the top of, of the colonies here are for this fungus actually secondary metabolites that are produced in so large amounts that they end up lying as small blobs on top of the colony. So this can be used for all sorts of things, um, bioactive compounds, pharmaceuticals, but also there's been recent patents where these compounds have been used as high octane fuels or proofs of concept for that. So there are a lot of, of good bioenergy and uh, scientific applications of these guys. So I'll be talking about, as Axel said, the status of the project, where we are, but I'll also be giving a few cases on where we're going with this. And as was stated, let's see, we're, um, we're trying to whole genome sequence all of the members of the uh, genus Aspergillus. So there are something like 350 members here. And what you're actually seeing on this picture is the view that you would get if you were lying underneath uh, an Aspergillus conidium and looking up into the wonderful uh, sky of spores here. So with that, we of course want to do a number of different things. And one thing that's been very important for us has been to serve the fungal community. There are a lot of things that can be interesting to people here. Uh, one thing has been that we've seen in, in the community that people have been, uh, there will have been a lot of people working on the same species which ended up with you know, the same five or six groups scooping each other over and over again, which is of course less constructive. But we're also interested in pumping out all of these new uh, carbohydrate degrading enzymes, uh, synthesis for bioactives with the applied angle. And then finally, we have some more um, basic applications of this, so using the information to link genes to the function of, of the organisms. So the project is all based in this local fungal collection we have at our university, which has two a large extent more or less literally been collected physically by uh, Professor Jens Frischvet, which who you see in the bottom here, um, from all over the world before that became a problem and through collaborators. So we have very large sets of fungi lying around in our, in our freezers here. And Jens is very good to have on the, on the project because this guy knows so much about fungi and metabolites that we at some point had a, a program at a research project at the university trying to make a machine learning approach to imitate the knowledge that we have in this guy, but it of course failed horribly. So we're still sticking with the, uh, with the real live uh, database version, which is Jens himself. So based on him and uh, the, the knowledge that he has, we picked these uh, members of these 350 plus species, so the phylogeny you can see here, and they're sorted into sections that look, uh, at least for a fungal biologist, relatively uh, different. So for instance, this is one section, section flavor, which has Aspergillus flavus, which produces one of the most toxic compounds known to man, aflatoxin. It's very close relative, uh, which is basically the domesticated version is used for soy sauce production and sake. So uh, there is a lot of diversity in each of these sections. Another member is Aspergillus niger, an industrial enzyme and acid producer, 
We also have this uh, model fungus or a reference species as Bagillus nigilans that's extensively used in molecular biology. But we also have some areas that uh, there isn't that much known about other than they are quite genetically different from the others, so very distinct branches. So this guy here, uh, Aspergillus flaviopase, um, but also the guys like Aspergillus terreus, which is used for production of, of uh, statins for cholesterol-lowering uh, drugs. Again, other types, Candidus, Spasis, Clavatus, which all of them represent groups of 20 to 40 different species that are related to them. And then we have very nasty critters like Aspergillus fumigatus here. So this guy kills uh, 600,000 people a year, roughly speaking, and has uh, at least 35 close relatives with, with varying degrees of, of uh, pathogenicity. And so the, the list goes on with all of these different ones. And around uh, the, the genus, you can find all sorts of interesting, specific, uh, weird fungi. So for instance, there's this guy here, Amuloboris, And as you can probably all see, it looks red. So the colony itself is completely white, but it secretes a very strong red dye here. And actually, there is, there's a company that's being pitched at our university, which is now using this and other fungi for produce of food colorants. So the applications of these compounds are pretty diverse. So with all of these fungi, we're trying to, uh, to collect the data and getting it, it sorted somehow. So the status at the moment is that we've sequenced, as you should be able to see roughly here, so 130 of these have been completed already. Another roughly 45 or so have been sequenced but not yet annotated. 45 or so are still in the process of being sequenced, and we have 120 or so where we're making DNA and RNA. So out of these 186 fungal genomes that JGI sequenced over the last 12 months, we are a sizable chunk of, of that portion. But that's been really interesting for us as well because we've had a good collaboration with JGI where we've sort of been helping each other developing and improving the multiplexing facilities of this. So We've been working with JDI and figuring out how to uh, reliably and relatively uh, stably ship off the genomes that we want sequenced in 96 well plates rather than, than uh, normal Eppendorf tubes. So that's been a, been a fun, uh, fun challenge all around. So <clears throat> in addition to this, we're so with the genomes that we have now, we have one and a half million genes that are sequenced and we're looking at. And we have five of these sections that I've marked with the plates out here that are nearly complete, meaning that nearly all of the members of those sections have been sequenced and we can start working with these guys. So what I'll be sharing with you is, is some of these results that we're getting out of it and some of the approaches that we're using here. So when you get all of this data, so very large uh, files with tons of sequence information, you really need to, to somehow come up with a way of working with this. And it's, if you've done any type of comparative genomics, um, and I had before this and relatively naively went into it thinking that doing comparative genomics on 300 species is roughly the same as doing it on four or five or six species. No, uh, that's uh, not at all the case. So things scale exponentially. So whatever you're doing with four or five becomes much harder if you're doubling that to, to 10 and even further up. So we've made some ways to, to fix that and handle that and try to structure our data in, in a way. So we're working in a, to a very large extent on orthology-based uh, approaches. So a bit a more modest version of, of uh, the, the superfamilies that Patsy just showed us. We're making protein families across species in our analyses, um, but we're quite conservative in our cutoffs, meaning that we only have very closely related species in this. So the way we're thinking about species and genes is actually quite, um, as a rule, that the where normally you would be thinking about a species in which genes are found in that species, we're actually thinking of it more in the orthogonal way. So we're actually mainly thinking about our genes as the units and then thinking about which species do the individual genes colonize. So we're trying to see it from the 
gene point of view. Where does the stat move in? Where does that have a genome niche, so to speak, to, to move into and thereby fit into the genome of that one? So the way that we're doing that, and I'll show the principle, not the actual way that we're doing it, is then if you dive into, in this case, the small set here, so that branch over here represents 26 species. Uh, Robert has done a nice job of, of doing uh, whole genome phylogenies of, of the genomes as they're coming in. So this is these 26 species based on a whole genome phylogeny. And then if you dive further into those guys, just for, for simplicity, you have a set of genomes here. We take those guys, and then you can look at them, and in our case, you get for each of them a genome with a gene count you have on the right, and the individual genes shown as a cartoon here. And you, of course, have, have that for all of them. So once you have that, we're, we're building these orthogonal families, or protein families, as we call them, by basically we blast everything against everything. It's, it's a bit computationally heavy, but once you've done it once, that means you will never have to blast anything again. So you can just query it uh, afterwards, which is quite nice. That allows us to literally search through billions, if not trillions, of features in milliseconds of scale. So that's, that's a nice trade-off once you've put in the computational time. So we build these families here of uh, putative orthologs across this, these species based on um, uh, how well and how similar the proteins are. So that's, that's roughly what we have, and what we can do with that is, is some of what I'll show you here in a second. So I have a, a few cases I want to, to share with you, and one is this uh, broad-scale correlation of phenotypes to genotypes. So you can look at it in, in two ways, and to introduce a few concepts in this way here. So one is, if this is your tree and all of these dots here as a species, uh, you want, might be interested in looking at genes that you find in all of the species. That's what we would call a, a part of the core genome or core, pro, core proteome, if you want. So that's one thing that's interesting to look at. Another thing that's interesting to look at is sets of genes that are orthologs that are only found in groups of species, because then you can start thinking about, well, if I know that this group of species have a certain phenotype in common, this set here that are only shared between those species is a good place to look for the genetic basis for that phenotype. So we've done that on, in this case, uh, the section Nigri that I mentioned earlier with its famous member, uh, Aspetillus niger. And the, each of the circles out here are individual species. The names are not that important, but the numbers and, and uh, circles that you see here at the branch points of the tree is the number of genes that you find shared in that group. So that would be where all of the members in that species have a member, uh, have a protein family that is shared by all of them. So down here we have yeast. So the genes that you find that are shared with both yeast and all of the aspergillae, that's 600 and something. And then we have this very interesting large group, <coughs> sorry, of more than 2,000 genes that are found in all of our aspergillae in this analysis, but not in yeast. And similarly, you have numbers here for some subgroups here, where this node here shows 200 genes that are found in all of these species in this branch. And up here, you have 117 genes that are found in all of the species found in this branch here. And there is, for all of these, there is a morphological difference. So of course, if you're comparing yeast to, um, uh, uh, to aspergillus, you'll see that you have a different morphology, but you also have a different lifestyle. So the genes that we're seeing when we're looking in this Aspergillus-specific gene set is very much everything that's involved in their lifestyle. So secreted enzymes that are used for biomass degradation is a huge part of this set here. So because you don't find those in yeast, even though they're essential functions for the Aspergillus. Similarly, this group up here has this morphology, and this group here has uh, this morphology. So these are called the so-called biseriates and the uniseriates. And again, we see functions here that relate to different differential regulation. So we see quite some regulatory proteins involved in these guys here, and also some um, cell wall biosynthesis genes involved in these guys here. So there seems to be a, a tool for looking into this. But we were quite interested in looking into more what the difference here is. So we dived into this a bit further. So 
since aspergillus niger is used for producing uh, acids and organic acids, this was an interesting topic to look at. And this plate that I show you here is, is one of the ways that we're scoring acid production. It's quite interesting in that it, it's made so that it changes color when the fungus is, is producing acid. So even though the acid is not visible, the, the, uh, the plate changes color. It's normally purple. You can see it on the corner out here. But in this case, Aspergillus niger is growing, producing acid, making the plate yellow. <coughs> So we looked at this for this um, paper that came out recently. This is, was done together with Ronald de Vries. This is a great paper. We had the best scientists. We had the best data. I think the impact of this thing will be huge. And what we got out of this was actually a very nice analysis uh, where we looked at the acid production of the species um, relative to the number of, of genes that we found that are producing these acids. So, if you're looking at the top there, there is citrate synthase, which is this bar here. And interestingly, so the darker the color, the more orthodox. Interestingly, there is this group here that are all known citrate synthase produ citrate producers that also have extra copies. So that was that's that's kind of interesting. It's not uh, terribly surprising, other than that we have more genomes than we had before and more species. But this was the sort of the overall analysis done in this paper. But since now we have 130 genomes, this was fun to look at in more scale. So we took out all of the 130 genomes and looked at it in more detail. And what you can see here is actually, so the bars here are the numbers of citrates since it's autologs you see in these guys. And nearly all of the species in the bottom here have two copies of this family here but some of them have extra copies. And actually, the guys you see over here are all of the biseriates of this section Negri I talked about. And those are actually the acid producers in that group. So, uh, as, so the section Negri has the biseriates that are primary acid producers. And they have extra copies of this citrate, citrate synthase, which may also have a role in methyl citrate um, uh, production and catabolism. And uh, the unisariates do not. So if you look at the bottom there, I've actually also put some examples of the plates here. The ones that are in the biseriates, they look yellow as a rule on the plates, and the others look purple as a rule on the plates. You may also note that um, some other groups have, over here, have uh, an extra copy of this. And these guys are actually not these guys are not acid producers, but in this, um, this group of species here, and this I think illustrates quite well the point that Patsy was making that even though they're, they're quite similar, the function may not be the same. Over here, it, the going hypothesis for these groups over here is that here the synthase is used as a precursor for this aflatoxin toxin I talked about earlier. So they have the same family of, of com Pounds, but over here it's used for uh, toxin production, and over here it seems to be involved in, in citric acid production. So we're having a bit of fun at the moment with cloning out this citrate synthase, and it actually seems to be sitting together with other uh, relevant enzymes for, for citrate production and moving it into another uh, host to see how uh, that affects citric acid production. <coughs> so. Another thing you can do when you're looking at all of these, which I've been intrigued by for a while, was whether it's possible to figure out which genes are actually defining a given species or which genetic uh, markers you can have for a certain species. And are there anything in common for these genes? So we could start looking at whether are there any type of driving mechanisms for speciation. And this here is work by uh, one of my PhD students who took uh, 80 species in this, in this case. The length of the bar to the right, you see the numbers, that's the number of proteins in each. And the section Negri I was talking about before is this tiny bit up here, so only 26 species, right, don't get compressed. So if you're looking at that, you can split it into these core genes I talked about. So roughly the number of genes that are found, or orthodox are found in all of the Aspergilli. And then you can look at the species defining genes. And those are, those are the ones marked in orange up here. And what's intriguing about this, I think, is that each species, whenever we get a new genome, we get 
between 500 and 1500 genes that we've never seen before. So of course this may be false positives and so on, but in that are also nuggets of gold, meaning for instance new enzyme with new specificities, new bioactive compounds, and other th things that are driving the, uh, that can be driving the speciation. So that's sort of the net thing that you have here. And in even this number, which I think is quite high, actually underestimates, I think, the impact of sequencing each one of them because we've been conservative in the way that we're counting here. So if we find a protein of just two species, it will not count in this orange bar that we have here. So you may, with, you know, with the next one you're getting, you may get you know, 2,000 new genes, but then with the next you get after that, 500 of those will not be unique anymore because its close relative also has it. But there's really a lot coming out of each new genome. So looking at that, we wanted to look at speciation in that regard. And when you're looking at this, we actually see that there are two main groups that are overrepresented in this set here. And those are genes involved in regulation, so transcription factors, and genes involved in biosynthesis of bioactive compounds. And our uh, going hypothesis on this is actually that those are also types of genes that you would expect to be quite mobile. They will work when they enter a new genome. So a transcription factor will go in, do something with the DNA, and if that's beneficial, that, that uh, species that receives the DNA will have an advantage and may branch out from its sister uh, clones at the, this point here. <laughs> Same with the bioactive compounds, right? You get in a new cluster, this may be toxic to all of your uh, clonal relatives, but you don't care because you're getting an advantage and getting the entire niece to yourself, so you're like a kid in a schoolyard with a flamethrower, just completely eradicating everyone around you, and then uh, have all of the toys for yourself afterwards. So, there seems to be quite some, some interesting mechanics going on here. A third category that we've seen, but that's not that overrepresented, is actually functions involved in carbon utilization. Again, this would make sense, right? You get an enzyme that allows you to eat a new carbon source. Great advantage. And then you have an advantage over the, your, uh, your clonal buddies. <clears throat> so the last case I want to go through before I leave you all for the, uh, the coffee break is, is this thing with linking all of these very interesting bioactive compounds to their genes. So as many of you may know, it's a painful task to identify which genes are involved in producing a specific bioactive compound. A lot of, of knockouts, a lot of characterizations, uh, it's a long and frustrating process. So we wanted to see if we can, could use this as a crowbar to break this open. And this seems to be quite useful, at least in some cases. So what we've done here is, what you're seeing up on your left or right, wherever you want to look, is for each of the species that are at the bottom, we've looked at which metabolites are found in these species under a variety of conditions. So it's, it's sort of a compounded version of, ex, uh, combination of experiments. So if there is a dot, it means that that species makes that compound under any condition. Not all conditions, but one or more conditions. So you can see some compounds like Orasborone B here. It's found in a lot of species. Some are only found in a few. And when you have the genomes and you have this knowledge, then you can start combining it and saying, well, we know that these must be coded for by genes, which means that, for instance, if we're interested in this compound down here, neoxalin, and that's found in these three genomes here, why not try to look for gene clusters that are found in these three species, right? And if you do that, and you have your families from what I mentioned before, we have a more, slightly more sophisticated version of these families for the secondary metabolites, but you know, it's a pretty lie, but it works anyways. Then you can go in and do a combinatorial analysis and say, well, give me all of the clusters that are found in these species here. And if you already know something about the chemical here, in this case, this is a non-ribosomal peptide, you can filter even more in the sets. So if you do this and you have compounds that are found in more than one species, all of a sudden you have this Rosetta stone for finding metabolites. So in this case, 
looking at these three species and the genomes, there was only one gene cluster with, with an NRPS that was found in all three of them. And this gene cluster has exactly the tailoring enzymes you would need in order to make this compound neoxalin. So that's a way of narrowing it down. We have a number of other cases where this worked, but several of them are considered for IP, so I can't really present them here. But trust me when I tell you that this works really well. Okay. So just to summarize a few things, we can, when we're comparing all of these hundreds of genomes, we can actually come up with some hypotheses on anything from evolutionary mechanisms to the actual pinpointing of the um, biochemical activities of specific genes, in particular, as I showed you with the last example uh, for bioactive compounds. We also see this um, trend or the thinking that I think is quite useful when you're working with, with genomes in this way is the phrase that I think came out of a paper by Antonis Rokas' group that you can see species as containers that are being colonized by caravans of genes. And if you're thinking about it in this manner, some of these things that can be quite hard actually sometimes becomes rather obvious. So, but we're moving, of course, forward from this. So what I've just showed you was mainly uh, uh, looking back in time to what we have done. What we're going into now is looking at wide-scale wide scale comparisons of which casimes are found in which species. There are already some really interesting things going on there, species with unique activities. We want to establish, so the phenomics was mentioned earlier. I really like this kind of omics. Um, so we really want to establish this as a large um, base of information so we can correlate our genes with phenomics data. And then we're moving, we're moving and using all of this for uh, powering a lot of our synthetic biology efforts. So similar to uh, Toby's excellent talk today, it's yesterday and uh, some of the really good efforts we've seen today, using these species as a harvesting ground for interesting enzymes for building up new activities and new pathways is, is very cool. And then a final thing that I think has been a bit underappreciated perhaps and this is, CRISPR is really cool for engineering things you're working with already. But what uh, collaborators at our university and others have, have shown is that CRISPR really allows us to go into interesting species X, with, which has not been made a lab pet before, and in a relatively short time frame, make it tractable for genetic, genetic engineering. And that means when we're finding something interesting in one of these species here, the first thing that we do is we, we discuss with ourselves, is it faster to move those genes into a model species or is it faster to take that species and convert that into a lab pet? And in many cases, and I mean, imagine this, you wouldn't even discuss this five years ago. I mean, you would just start cloning and uh, sweating. And, and now you can actually, in many cases, we end up with the Let's just make a lab pet out of it because that's what we need in order to do this. Knocking out genes in an organism is, is often not that complicated compared to the problems you get when you're doing heterologous expression. So, fun, fun, fun. So I have a, a long list of, of acknowledgments here um, and the list is probably even longer. It's a huge project as you can imagine. I just want to point out the technicians that are sweating to organ to uh, to isolate all of the DNA and RNA that's needed here. It's no trivial task. Also, the, our genome analysis team, or the genominators, as they're also known, that are doing most of, of the in-house analysis on this. And of course, the JDI people that are providing the wonderful, wonderful sequences and the, uh, the annotation and, and uh, uh, large-scale analysis of a lot of this. And of course, the people paying the, uh, the bills that you see on the right there. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. And if there are no questions, I'll put up a few of my own you can think about while you're listening to the others. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, when you were talking about the species-specific genes, 
Are those uh, genes that you don't see in any of the other species? Uh, or are they genes that are sort of patchily distributed in sister taxa don't have them? Uh, so <clears throat> we actually operate with two sets. So uh, I get the confusion. So we work with, with one type of species-specific genes, which are genes that we don't find in any of the other Aspergillus species. That's sort of our typical way of looking at it. Because what we're thinking is, if we don't find it in any of the other Aspergillus species, it's probably a horizontal gene transfer, and we want to be able to cast them. But what we've also started looking at, which is a lot more computationally heavy, is looking at which genes are not found in any genome out there whatsoever. So examining, the, examining that set against the entire NAR database and look at whether you hit something. But as a rule, we're mainly looking at whether they are unique in the Aspergillus content, context. Do you know the origins of a lot of them? Are they from other fungi or bacteria? Yeah, there was a, a talk at the Fungal Genetics Conference by my PhD student, Jane, who's been looking into this. And we're seeing that the majority of other sources are uh, relatively closely related fungi, like penicillium and fusarium. And, but uh, we also see much more distant uh, transfer from uh, more distantly early branching fungi, and in some cases also bacterial genes. So, but, yeah. Okay. Uh, when you align the uh, pathways from the species that create the same uh, metabolite, how similar are those genes on an individual blasting level? Uh, I didn't quite hear the first part of the I'm question, so but, oh, but... Oh, sorry. That's huh. much better. Okay. Yeah, yeah um, when you... Al is it still... Okay. When you align the um, pathways uh, of the organisms that generate the same metabolite, how similar are the genes on an individual, like a comparative level, sequence similarity? Uh, yes. So that's a complicated question. The short answer is it varies. Okay. Um, in some cases, they're quite similar. And in some cases, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing variation. But just off the bat, I would say 80 to 85% identity. Yeah. You identified a horizontal gene transfer as an important contributor to uh, new pathways. How about? gene duplication and neo-functionalization? Yeah. Uh, so I think gene duplication is, is really important. Um, but we haven't, I mean, we haven't as such gone into depth with this at the moment, um, sort of, uh, because the way that we're building these families means that, that uh, orthologs or gene duplications will end up in the same family. But we are doing, like I showed with the uh, citric acid synthase example, that's exactly a case of that, where you go in and see, okay, there's an expansion of this function in this species, what's going on here? So we're looking at it at the, at the metabolism level primarily at the moment. Um, so, so that's what we're doing. But that's a lot more labor slash uh, analysis heavy rather than simply just tossing out everything that's not uh, found in more than one species, right? But it's, it's a very interesting area, and I think differentiation and phenotype-wise, there's a lot hiding there. Absolutely. Okay, let's, let's take one last question. Uh, before we go into the break, uh, I, am I right that citric acid is, we can find it every can of soda? Yes. Yeah. So one of your slides demonstrates alarming proximity of those species and those that produce aflatoxin. So is it another reason for us to stay away from soda? <laughs> um, I think if, if the FDA is doing their job properly, then I think you're pretty OK, um, which I would assume that they are. So yeah, OK. OK, so uh, with that, uh, let's thank Michael again.